my friends, and welcome to episode 108 of the Kiss Army Nation podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Pasquale Verri. And I am Claudio Spera. Welcome to the show, everyone. So we've often mentioned in previous episodes, one of the things which make Kiss so special is the diversity in their music. So it begs the question, what is considered a typical Kiss song? Actually, what is considered a typical Kiss album for that matter? And where has Kiss diverted from their formula? So we're going to tackle this question in three parts. So part one, we're going to take a look at what we consider to be typical Kiss albums. Part two, uh, we'll look at the albums which diverted from the Kiss formula. And part three, we're going to create two greatest Kiss compilations. The first compilation will focus on typical Kiss songs and the second on atypical songs. All right, guys, keep in mind, at the end of the episode, we're going to have a little surprise twist. So for our listeners, I suggest that you listen to the entire episode to understand the point of that particular twist. So I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts on that. And it's also a surprise for us. So we it's going it to be is. a surprise for you guys as well. <laughs> I didn't tell any of you yet. <laughs> so to uh, so then uh, to take on this challenge, uh, we're joined once more uh, by our panel guests, uh, Patrick DeMontigny and Craig Patton. Welcome back to the show, guys. Always a pleasure. Thanks, guys. So first of all, uh, Craig, I want to congratulate you on your uh, new job. Oh, thank you. And uh, you said that you're going to start working tonight at 10.30. So um, at the time of this recording, it's now 7.12. You might make it to work on time because <laughs> this is going to be a long freaking night. <laughs> so because it's going to be a, uh, a longer than usual episode, we think, um, we're not going to uh, go into the off the topic question and we're going to go right to the topic at hand. So. I want to start by creating a baseline for what we consider to be quintessential KISS. So the first question, is it safe to say that the first three albums are considered typical KISS? We'll start with Patrick. I think they are because I think it set the tone for what we expect from KISS, you know, short but and to the point, uh, pretty much in your face. So not a really new style, but a style that fit and work mm -hmm. for Kiss. And uh, in my opinion, yeah, I think that's um, that's pretty much what set the tone once again. Because if you, when you, we go to shows, much of the songs are from the first three albums, especially the first album. They still play Deuce, um, you know, Black Diamond, uh, maybe even 100,000 Years, depends uh, on the tour, but or some, so I would say, or Rock and Roll Night, of course, of Dress to Kill. So I think, yeah, it's, uh, to me, that's what defines the, the, the Kiss sound, the first three albums. Okay, Craig, what do you think? Yeah, agree very much with Pat. I, 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 think, I think that a lot of those songs are definitely on the set list, and if they're there, it's because they're standards and they're, they're definitely classics. Um, also, I think it's it's a stage to what's coming with with the second set with uh, Destroyer, Rock and Roll Over, and Love Gun. I think it's a, a prequel to that, definitely. Uh, it, it's defining their own sound, I think, in those days because those were you know breaking albums that that basically didn't hear that kind of music until Kiss came along, and I and I think that uh, definitely they're the the bread and butter of uh, of, of Kiss's uh, career. Okay, Claudio. Well, to me, yes, the, the, the answer is uh, definitely, uh, it's a quintessential kiss. And uh, as Pat was saying, if you take a look at the set list, you know, almost 50% of the songs, they come from all those uh, three albums uh, in, in the in kiss, kiss story, right? So not, not, not in the set list today, but, you know, uh, uh, over the years, uh, they, they play most of the songs from, from those three albums. And uh, if 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 you take a look at what happens with most of the bands too, so the, the I think the first albums they most of the time they capture you know the energy they capture the the essence of the band, and um, they always go back to the roots. And in the case of Kiss, to me, there's uh, no 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 denial that uh, those three set the tone for uh, what Kiss was all about. 
I, I like what you said. What you said, um, it sets the uh, the roots um, for the band, and and that's the thing, right? When a band starts off, their first few albums, they had time to plant that seed and allow the roots to grow. They, right. they, they a lot of them wrote these songs like way before they actually started in the band. And right. Kiss, Kiss is no different, right? A lot of these songs were already written before they became before they became Kiss. So it makes sense that yeah, this is definitely typical quintessential Kiss. They had so much time to do it, whereas later on they were they had their hands tied with with deadlines and and putting out records every year. They had to write stuff on the road, and it might have been less Kiss. But these three albums. Um, definitely, absolutely. You know, if you look at the first album, the only throwaway I see there is uh, obviously Kiss in Time and also, you know, mm-hmm. Love Theme from Kiss. Yeah. So even even in their first album, there were a couple of songs that were not considered typical Kiss, but I understand why that is, especially with Kissing Time. We all know mm-hmm. the story behind that. Mm-hmm. I think Hotter Than Hell, in my opinion, is um, the perfect Kiss album, especially at the beginning. It's definitely hotter than hell. Um, one of my favorite albums actually is is uh, is Dress to Kill, but even Dress to Kill, I found that it started slowly to deviate away from the typical formula of the first two albums, and mm. that's because of the influence of Neil Bogart. I found this album to be a lot poppier than the other two albums, a lot more uh, radio friendly, um, uh, listener friendly than the first right. two albums. You know, yeah. and and it's interesting that what we consider the top three quintessential Kiss albums, even within that span, we start to see a little diversion into something else. Right. Yeah. Good point. It's true. It's true, yeah. and uh, and it's also uh, these these guys they were trying to find you know the sweet spot. You know, they were they were so green at that time that uh, mm-hmm. you know all the rawness and energy was in the first one. Then. Uh, Hotter Than Hell was really dark uh, from the sound perspective. And you're right. So Dress to Kill It was more rocky, you know, uh, popular and uh, dancing kind of stuff. Yeah. So uh, so we touched on the first uh, three albums. Then um, let's, let's uh, I think it's first, it's safe to say that the following three albums, the second trilogy, you know, uh, Destroy Your Rock and Roll Over and Love Gun, are part of the classic Kiss sound. So, but even with those three albums, we already begin to see, again, Kiss diverting away from their classical sound or their classic sound. So, in your opinion, which songs are beginning to divert from what fans consider typical Kiss? Fred? Well, this is a this is an era where I really got turned on to Kiss uh, with the with Destroyer, and then you back, backtrack with the catalog and you get... Uh, Get familiar with those albums. Um, this is my favorite time period. Uh, it's it's the hype of Kiss. It's the it's the best times uh, uh, that they had with, with uh, popularity and uh, Gallup polls and all that. Um, but there is some strange songs on those albums that are starting to experiment with different themes with Bob Ezrin and and uh, it comes to mind for me is uh, Great Expectations. Mm-hmm. Um, that was a kind of a, a head scratcher at the time. Uh, Beth too, where it, where it goes down to a slower slower tone, and it's like everybody knows the story. They flipped the record over, and it became a great success. Um, then she kissed me too. Why we would they would do a cover on on Love Gun when they had more than enough material throughout yeah. the years? We've seen the, a lot of uh, throwaways from that era. Mm-hmm. Um, it's beyond me why they would do that. Uh, Hard Luck Woman too is another one that's um, that's gained popularity in the latter years rather than that time. I mean, I had a video for it and stuff, and but it was I think in that genre of the of the Beth era. Um, See you in your dreams also is another one that seems to resurface a few times uh, on Gene's solo album and other variant uh, of that song. Um, I find that one too a little bit um, out of place. Uh, Tomorrow and tonight's another one where. Um, it's a good song, but is it a Kiss anthem? I don't, I don't think so. But then again, they never really played it live, right? It's on live too. It's it's been dubbed, right? And Hooligan, Hooligan is a thing that uh, I think they did to appease Peter Chris in those days. Um, it's another song that I think that just was in there to give him a song, basically, in that album. Yeah. Yeah. Patrick, what's your take? Um, yeah, I agree. The the 
the one, the strangest one was uh, Great Ex Expectations. Um, weird song. I always thought it was kind of odd. Um, and also, I think the difference between the first trilogy and the second trilogy is the first trilogy, Kiss was that dangerous underground band, whereas with Destroyer, Rock and Roll Over and Love Gun, they became super kiss now as craig was saying the band that wow all of a sudden everybody loves or hates and <laughs> depends yeah. on you and um so that led to they have grander ideas like okay let's do a let's do a slow song like that which was kind of good in a way because every band has its ballad so uh but that doesn't mean they should have a ballad on every record afterwards um, so yeah, I think it, it gave them the impression of saying we can experiment a little bit more. And I'm totally with Craig, like, what's with this? And then she kissed me. I th that's horrible. I'm sorry. <laughs> but I also like it, but I think it's horrible. Um, but aside from that, you know, uh, Destroy was more progressive, of course, as we all know, whereas Rock and Roll Over and Logan, I think they're, they have more in common with the first three records. Mm -hmm my opinion so the songs it depends which ones you like or don't like but the songs that stand out i'm pretty much with craig those three and then she kissed me uh beth and great expectations are like you know really out of the kiss formula okay Pask. well basically i think craig and patrick said it all i mean i, yeah. I agree with absolutely everything that they said the only thing is um you know in the question, it read, you know, those three albums, even those three albums, it started to divert away from the KISS formula. I don't think it was diverting away from the KISS formula. I think it was, um, I think the band was was evolving. And I, I think, uh, I like the direction the band went with Destroyer, and the band panicked and went to more of their roots with Rock and Roll Over, which is closer to the first three albums. And then Love Gun, again, more user-friendly um, music in for the for the most part in uh, in in my opinion. But the interesting thing here is that like Craig, I got into the band in this era, Destroyer on. So for me, this is the typical Kiss sound. And with those three albums, for me, it's always been that. And I remember not liking the first three albums. I mentioned this on, on previous episodes. I found it too too heavy, too hard, you know. But these three I found were more uh, friendly to my uh, to my young ears. I thought mm -hmm. this was typical Kiss, in my opinion. Okay, so uh, to me, um, yeah, the songs, as as you guys said, you know, the the, the typical, you know, Beth, the Heart of a Woman, uh, Great Expectations, even Sweet Pain on on Destroyer. It's kind of uh, as is. Kind of some strange instruments there so uh nothing that uh, we were used to with the first uh, three albums but what you know those those three they keep a special place in my heart because to me uh it's it's very hard to kind of to separate the music from the image and to me when you say kiss when you say typical kiss to me it's from 76 to 78 right so it's it's those photo sessions you know, all, all the huge stage, you know, the production, they were on the top of uh, of uh, of their of their game at that time. So to me, that's that means typical kiss. Now, in terms of music, it is interesting that when we when we say diverting, sometimes we think of, of a linear kind of thing. But you know, the, the more the more the more di diversion that happened was with destroyer, and then they came back, right? Because they were they were not feeling very comfy with with Bob, and uh, they was they were starting to to be some cracks with Ace and Peter. So then they wanted to please them and to play safe, and they came back with uh, Eddie Kramer, you know, for Rock and Roll Over and Love Gun. So it's kind of a, it's a, it's so interesting, you know. There's so many different angles on on history that we can be talking about this forever. But um, yeah, to me, it's a. Uh, uh, Destroyer definitely was uh, was an interesting milestone in, in in the career of the band. You know, different sound. You know, definitely. Mm -hmm. I think after the um, the era of the first six albums, I think that's when we started to see a diversion into something different musically, oh, yeah. and Absolutely. not and not counting the solo albums. We're not gonna we're not gonna we're not gonna go there. Yeah. Um, but again, we're starting yeah. to see a movement away from the classic sound, and not just on a few songs, on a few albums, like the first six, 
but on entire albums, yeah. right? So a great example of that, and the start of that, I think, was uh, Dynasty. Yeah. So let's look at Dynasty. How mm -hmm. and why are we beginning to see this change in the band now? Claudio, we'll start with you this time. Well, to me, it's mm -hmm. basically due to the music trend. Okay, so uh, we have to remember that late in the 70s and early 80s, uh, disco was basically dominating, you know, the market. And at that time, Kiss had become more than a band. It had become a company. And, uh, and they were trying to position both the image and the music on the mainstream. Okay, they were not, they were not a rock and roll band anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and also we have to remember that with 50% of the band not happy with the direction that the band was going, in the case of Ace and Peter, uh, it was clear to me that Kiss was really, really, really confused at that time. So they, maybe they listened to the wrong people, uh, but maybe it made business sense. But to me, that's why, you know, the band kind of took a 180 degree from what they were doing before. Okay, Patrick. I think yeah, I, I agree with uh, with uh, Klausio, but also I think they were looking at what other bands were doing. Now you got to remember in '78, uh, the Rolling Stones uh, released "Miss You," uh, the record. I think it's "Some Girls" actually, which has a very very uh, discoish type of sound. And I think that's just my opinion. Probably Kiss went well. If the Stones can go disco, so can we. Uh, because probably they were figuring out after the solo albums what to do next. Uh, probably they didn't want to repeat themselves with the previous uh, albums. So instead of going into a heavier direction, keep that, they opted to go the pop direction. And uh, mind you, Dynasty is not that bad. It does have its moments, but I think the whole disco, um, disco um, tag that it has kind of changed the band after that all right craig what do you think yeah here's the thing they they come off the solo albums like they were saying and it's like okay where do we go right uh they, they go to the music trends what's happening it's more danceable music it's more and i go back to the story of paul stanley saying he was in a, a disco maybe studio 54 or whatever and he says to what sits there and say, I can write these songs. Like, like I, I can write this song. So he wrote that song, I was made for loving you, what 20 minutes and became a monster hit. It's fluff music, right? So it's it's like like Pat was saying, you know, other bands were, were diverting into that era, um, keeping up with the times, what's going on. Do they want to release a heavy um, creatures of the night during that time? It would have been a fail, right? So it's it's basically what supply and demand wants. Yeah. And uh, they definitely catered to what, what was going on. Now, Ace and Peter did not like the, that era. And it shows because they didn't play on, on most of the tracks on that. And they've had a couple, they had a couple of songs. Mind you, the Ace songs that, that are on there, I think, are, are pretty damn good. And I think it's yeah. probably one of his greater contributions. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I think it undershadowed, right? Those those tracks, uh, Save Your Love, The Dirty, uh, the, the Hard Times. Hard Times. And, yeah. I mean, those are those. Are, and yeah, I like those songs. Um, so it's a rock album slash danceable music, right? So I, I, yeah, definitely. Would you guys agree with what you said? And those are my points on that. I love this topic because I find that this subject has so many layers that we could we could peel away. Mm. And I think with this particular question, it really begs the question. You know what? What makes Kiss Kiss, right? How many fans have said, oh, with Tommy and Eric, it's not Kiss? I is that what makes Kiss? The four members, the makeup, or is it the music that makes Kiss? And mm -hmm. I'm leaning more towards, well, it's obviously the music that makes Kiss. And yes, obviously with, with Peter and Ace, they're responsible for the core of what Kiss was musically. And but that could be reproduced if possible. It can't be reproduced with the with the typical Kiss sound. Now, what I thought, what I think happened at this era was that I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I agree with you guys. They're probably following trends and stuff like that. But I think we started to see the beginnings of the band being lost and they didn't know which direction to take musically, even visually. Um, they were they were still writing the coattails of their success of the last the last six albums. 
you know, mm -hmm. and now it was like the return of Kiss yeah. and and the anticipation to see them live and to come out with a new album. And it, it, it was huge at the time. Huge. I remember, you know, and then the disappointment of the album, the disappointment of the show. Um, it it, it mm -hmm. wasn't making any money because the production w w was way too big. So uh, I think we start to see the beginnings of Kiss losing sight of who they were. And that right. was the result of Dynasty and that particular era and what came later. Yeah, I agree with you, Pat. I, I think also that you, you touched on that return of Kiss uh, slogan. And I remember those days seeing everything, return of Kiss, the return of Kiss, and these over-the-top costumes and, yeah. and on 16 Magazine, Cream, they're all over, everywhere, right? The, is Kiss Dead? Is uh, these new new unif the costumes, uh, uniforms, <laughs> these new costumes and such? It was definitely a, a lost time where they just threw yeah. everything out there and say, "Okay, what's sticking?" You know? I I think the band thought they were bigger than they were at the time. Exactly. You know? Yeah, and and, 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 and it appealed to the kids. It didn't appeal to the rockers. Yeah, they had yeah. no idea that was happening. They had no clue. Yeah, yeah. I agree. True. True. Uh, so another change in the Kiss sound, it's it's uh, obviously en masse. Uh, so what are your thoughts about this drastic change in the band's music? Pask, we're going to start with you. Okay, so yeah, it, it, it makes sense that Unmasked came out considering where the band was. They were lost and they were and they were they were they were drowning and they needed something, a, a life jacket, a lifeboat, something to keep them afloat. So one of their biggest songs at the time was I Was Made For Loving You. Let's see if we can somehow recreate that. But hey, not just one song. Let's recreate that with an entire album. It's going to be a smash. Really? No, no. Again, they, they just didn't know who they were, where they were going, and they were lost. And the result of that was, was unmasked. Again, from the beginning of this episode, we're saying that the beauty of the band is the diversity in their music. They didn't do that intentionally because they were pioneers in music. They did it to save their asses. Era mm -hmm. after era after era. And that was the result, Dynasty Unmasked. Mm -hmm. And again, what came later after that? You know, it's it, it, it's it's really interesting that, but I'm glad all that happened because looking back, we got so much incredible oh, yeah. diverse music in this band that many bands can't claim to have. Yeah. But boy, what a road to get where they are now. Mm -hmm. What a road. So, Pask, let, let, let me ask you guys, uh, um, because uh, as, as everybody knows, you know, I, I, I was not around here in, in North America at that time. So how, how was the reception of uh, Unmasked at that time? Was it kind of really cold? It was worse than Dynasty? Many people started to kind of uh, take off from the band? I remember what, what, what Craig was saying when Dynasty came out, it was, Kiss was everywhere. The return of Kiss here, the return of Kiss right. there, magazines. And I remember Unmasked, it just quietly came out. Yeah, I don't remember there being any hoopla, any, yeah. any, okay. anything to really promote it and hype it up. I don't, I don't remember any of that. Okay. I don't know about the rest of you. Yeah. Yeah. It was like, uh, oh, Kiss, they're passe. You know, it was oh, ACDC really? in 1980. Yeah, I right. remember that. Yeah. Move over, yeah, yeah. kiss. Here comes ACDC. Of course. Yeah. Greg, uh, what's your take on the question? Unmask. Yeah, I remember like they were they were saying that uh, like like you guys were saying with Dynasty. What what's next? What what's the next thing? So let, let's continue. What is the success um, formula now? So let's go into more poppy stuff. I remember going to to a record store during the the uh, Unmask time, walking around. Kiss released a new album. I didn't know about that. Oh. I looked at it and I go, what is this? Is this a comic book or is it is it an album, right? So I picked it up, put it on, and like first song, um, okay, is that you? It's not a Kiss song. It's it's a, another rewrite, you know? Um, keep on listening. There's a couple of tracks in there, Naked City and stuff, that's a little more rockier than, than Poppy. But you, you see, they started to diverse from America, North America and start going to Europe because it was a smash yep. over in, in, in Australia. They they couldn't get enough fans in, in the stadium or or for, yep. for events. Um, they started asking themselves, is this working somewhere else and not here? Well, let's 
focus on Europe and not much so much about North America because that's where the money is. Yep. Um, Europe too. You know, it's it's just a different time, a different um, flavor of the month. That you know, like Pass was saying, it's diversity, right? So whatever mood you're in, you want to listen to something dark. Well, maybe the first three albums. You want to listen to something. Yeah, you know, we all have different times of uh, of albums and favorite favorite albums and it the, the catalog has so many different genres that we could just put on whatever we feel like you're in a poppy mood uh, okay let's put on a mask if you're in a in a down mood let's put on uh carnival of souls right <laughs> but, true. Uh, true it's um it's definitely a, a change that is even the costumes and even the the, the stage show and stuff it's it was more directed towards uh, another part of the world that uh, yeah. they, were, they were definitely more popular than North America. Yeah. They just didn't do any any touring in, in, in North America for that. And you know what? It has its place in history. Yeah, true. I agree. But you know, Gene said it best in Kiss Extreme Close Up. Kiss became a pop band. You couldn't imagine that happening, but that's what it was happening. They became a pop band. Now, of course, when Unmask came out. I think the the whole vibe was like, oh, who cares? Kiss sold out. I'm moving on to other bands now. <clears throat> Since they hadn't been so popular in other parts of the world, you know, they wanted to, you know, explore that part of the world. And when you think about, when I think of Kiss Unmasked, I think about Australia, yep. the craze over there. So they, it, they didn't have time to realize what was happening back in North America. <clears throat> so I think uh, in a sense... Unmask kind of like put them into like a haze where they didn't realize. And but even a year or two after in Australia, the hype had died down. So I think Unmask, I always say that if it would have been produced with a heavier sound, it could have been one of their best because there's some good tracks on that. Oh, yeah. that Naked oh, yeah. City, uh, the Ace songs are good. Uh, you know, so I think uh, I'm trying to imagine that album would have heavier sound it would have been right up there with heaven and hell british steel from you know judas priest and black sabbath unfortunately it wasn't so it's the pop era of kiss yeah. um what i think about uh, and mass of course to me was the like a follow on of uh, dynasty but on 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 steroids right so big big time uh it was like a sequel of of, of the of the previous album and to me as you guys said you know you basically you said it all a uh, huge success in, in Australia and uh, Europe. Uh, at that time, they were not touring South America, but, you know, Dynasty and Mask were the, the the biggest, you know, uh, selling albums of the band. So many people didn't know that uh, Kiss had albums before those two. So many people thought that they were the first two albums of the band. Huge promotion and, you know, big sales. Um, but at the same time, I want to touch on something. I, I think that towards the 79, 80, that's when basically Gene started to kind of be a, a bit distant from the band. And it became more more like a Paul's band. And and uh, if you read, uh, you know, behind the scenes, uh, behind the makeup, sorry, uh, the, the book, it says that, you know, uh, Paul was feeling great writing those kind of songs, you know, more, mm -hmm. even more for a mask. Than, than than Dynasty. And he had a good rapport with Vinnie Poncia. Uh, but the, you know, the thing that we have as KISS fans, uh, the, the, the KISS story is so rich that we always have something to compare, to compare against. Yeah. But if you, if you take Unmasked as a standalone record, it's fantastic. I, I, to me, you know, it's the most uh, up to that time is the most elaborate album of all because the, the rest was more like meat and potatoes, you know, rock and roll, except for Destroyer, of course. But um, I, I think Kiss fans, they were not prepared to 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 get this kind of shock with this type of music. But uh, it is true that it comes hand in hand with being a bit confused and trying to find, again, a common ground. And... Um, but there was there was also turmoil in, in the band, right? So uh, Peter leaving and uh, you know Ace was really you know 
after the success of the 78 uh, album, uh, he he wrote, you know, good songs for, for both albums, for, for Dynasty and Unmasked. Yeah, very interesting. So now looking looking backwards and looking back in time, it's it looks like you know the decline of Kiss, but um I think it's one of the albums that it's most valued these days. Hmm. Interesting. Very nice take. I'll say. Yeah. All right. So moving forward, we're not going to include music from the elder on this episode, uh, because we discussed it on episode 106 entitled uh, Who Steered That Ship. And it's funny because we could take that entire episode and stick it in right here. Yeah, it, it, it fits. It fits really well with what uh, we're talking yeah. about. So instead, let's look at the '80s in general, right? So, which album or albums would you consider to be typical Kiss records in the '80s, Patrick? According to my taste, Preachers and Lick It Up, because everything that came afterwards during the '80s was. Uh, I see a band lacking focus, uh, especially from one of the core members, Gene. Um, and also I'm seeing a band who has a hard time trying to find its identity after the removal of the makeup. Uh, you can tell that they're trying to see, oh, okay, well, mm, Motley Crue, mm, no, let's be White Snake, mm, let's be, you know, Heart or whatever. So I see a band really looking for itself, and it's it breaks my heart to say it. I'm not saying that to to put them down. I, I, they say it themselves. They were very lost, and uh, but creatures and lick it up had they had kept that uh, vibe, I think they could have had a wonderful second life. But I think after that, the the lack of involvement from Gene <clears throat> and you know the, the changes with the guitar players and things like that kind of affected the band in a way so it 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 did take its toll on the sound and the direction you know it took a, a you know few albums for them to say mm, maybe we, we want to go this way that's my take on the 80s okay claudia what do you think i i'm i'm with uh, with pat to me uh, creatures and lick it up they stand out um i think uh that the 80s was the was the era when Kiss experienced the most drastic change. And basically because of the changes in the lineup. You mm -hmm. know, when when you when you lose, you know, the this tandem of, of Paul and Ace on guitar, then you become a different band. And uh, as Pat said, you know, with uh with uh Gene, you know, being completely off, uh, of course it became uh, more than ever, a pulse band, and uh, again, I'm not uh, I'm, I'm not diminishing any of the uh, any of the albums from Kiss in the '80s, but uh, uh, as a typical Kiss sound, I have to stick with uh, Creatures, which is fantastic to me, and lick it up. All right, Craig, what do you think? Listen, totally agree with what the the two former gentlemen said. Uh, the, <laughs> uh, but here's a twist. Okay, uh, 80s music for me. One song stands out as going back to the roots of rock and roll, and that's Animal Eyes, I've Had Enough. Whoa. Okay. Whoa. That opening track for me is the start of, okay, let's go back to heavy rock. The rest of the album, well, hit and miss. Come out with Lick It Up, Exciter. These songs are typical creatures of the night, crunch, in your face songs. Right. That's the way the direction they need to go. Uh remember seeing uh, um um MTV taking off the makeup, the big hype, blah blah blah, and Gene going, Hello. well, you know what? It wasn't an act, it was really that. Yeah, was like, yeah. <laughs> uh, let's let's throw darts at the wall and let's hope we hit the target because this is our last life. Yeah. you know that that's my take on those on those albums um i think it started with analyze that one song if that whole album had been rocky like that i think that maybe creatures and that stuff would have been a continuation of what they yeah. were playing my take good that's cool i never i never saw it that way very interesting yeah, yeah. very interesting greg you're on fire tonight you're on fire now, love you, love you. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you were to take the baseline that's considered typical Kiss 
the first three albums, possibly the first six albums. Mm -hmm. I think the only album that comes close to being a typical Kiss album, obviously we've all said it, Creatures of the Night. Mm -hmm. Creatures would have been would have been great right after Love Gun. It would work. The seventh album, mm -hmm. Creatures of the Night, it would work. Um, mm -hmm. Would would Lick It Up have worked after Love Gun? Nope. In my opinion, totally different sound. Uh, 80s Kiss, non-makeup Kiss was a different band. They weren't they weren't typical Kiss, according to our baseline from the 70s. Yeah, yeah. You know, if we ask the question, what do you consider typical Kiss in the 80s? Definitely lick it up. And 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 like Craig was saying, a lot of those hard songs from Animal Eyes and uh, Asylum, you know, would be typical Kiss. But for me, it would be just creatures uh, that I consider to be a typical Kiss album in the 80s. Mm -hmm. And uh, let, let me just uh, go off, off script here. So why, why do you think that they came up with albums like uh, Asylum and uh, we're going to touch on Crazy Nights, of course, you know, but because that, that's a big diversion from the sound. But um, what happened? So what happened with Asylum, with uh, Crazy Nights? So uh, I, I think oh. like Pat, I think like Pat said, at that point, it was it was Paul's ship to steer. The band was his, and he was going. He was going with the trends at at the time. Yeah. Like Pat was saying, the the Bon Jovi, the White Snake, the you know the the Motley Crue. Yeah. He was trying to be everything and everyone. Yeah. But you know, can, can you blame him? Again, he, they were treading right. water, and and he was doing this by himself. He 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 did whatever he can to keep the band alive, and he wrote some pretty amazing songs during the '80s Kiss era. Yeah. Not typical Kiss, yeah. but really good songs. Nothing, you know, they weren't pioneer. He wasn't a pioneer in music writing at that time. And oh. it was like everything else that was written in the 80s, I think. But a very good effort on Paul's part. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's also like the era of keyboard kiss. Yeah, um, you right. know, Van Halen came out uh, with synthesizer songs and then, and, and then Kisses followed suit. And, and, and a lot of under, underrated songs in that and in that, in those old albums too, right? Um, if you look at the album cover of Asylum, I mean, it's okay like what is this <laughs> you know yeah it, it's what it was in those days that the, the the style the, the the clothing had all those kind of blotchy yeah, clothes colors. and everything and, mm -hmm. but um it's definitely for me it's keyboard kiss yeah, yeah. I agree. yeah uh, same thing i think uh you know it was it, it was um not the loudest band the loudest look because all the bands you, you know you, you you see the band you see a photo of any band or you hear a song from any artist you know it's the 80s yeah it has that typical sound typical image it was the vibe so i think that's that's what it is basically so and kiss we're no we're not immune to that mm -hmm. true true i think i think uh, this this era with the crazy nights and asylum i think that's that's when the band took uh no risk at all so they yeah. just wanted to play safe and, uh, you know, in history, um, the band took so many risks and they, they wanted to kind of uh, shake the tree a bit against the market. But this time around, they wanted to survive. And to me, they became followers. Of course, they were not on the on. on they were not leading for a long time. OK, no. but uh, they really became followers. They wanted to pretend being, you know, Bon Jovi or, or Aerosmith or those kind of guys. You know? mm -hmm. Okay, I just want to say one more thing about uh, Crazy Nights, right? Because again, I think that Crazy Nights is a diversion um, from typical 80s Kiss sound, not including the Gene Simmons songs, take those out of the equation, but Paul Stanley songs for the most part, I think was classic Kiss 80s. And even then in the 80s, I felt Kiss was again getting lost and they were trying to gain more popularity, some popularity. Um, yeah. Maybe they felt like they were they were in the down, downward spiral once again. They needed something to boost them up, so they came up with uh, with Crazy Nights, a totally poppy synthesized record, yeah. easy yeah. listening to the ears, you know, easy listening for 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 the radio. But even if you come, don't even compare it to, to the classic '70s Kiss. Mm. But even compare it to the rest of the '80s Kiss song, it's so it, it diverted so far away from that sound. 
And my God, they got lost in the 70s with classic Kiss. And now they got even more lost in the 80s Kiss. Where are they going to go from here? Yeah. 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 If I can add a few things on there, I, I remember seeing that it peaked number 18 on Billboard when it came out, uh, double platinum in, in Canada and such. And so it did have some some oomph into it, right? Yeah. yeah. But but it's for me, it's like rock to plastic rock, right? And I don't know if you guys agree with me, but the sound, think of the 80s sound. This album could have been a Rocky Four soundtrack. You know the nice. music in the background and stuff. Oh, it's, yeah. it's, I love it. It's, it's that it's that type of music. I agree. True. It's true. You know, it's I can just see Rocky there. there you know, no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, oh, no, nice. In the background. Yeah, no, you hit the nail on the head. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. Exactly what it is. <laughs> you know, Crazy Nights was Kiss trying to be hard. You know, in some ways, same producer. Yeah, trying to be survivor. You know, like yeah, exactly. Anyway, my but he did, he did, he did have uh, some interesting uh, success in the UK, for instance. You know, yeah. it was uh, had a lot of traction. It's interesting how you know, depending, you know, the markets. Sometimes uh, you hit it, you know, you you get it, and then some other places, you know, you're completely forgotten. You know, yeah. it's interesting. So once again. For the second time now, the band is in like a do or die situation. We either bring back the classic sound or we die, you know? So in your opinion, uh, do you believe that Hot in the Shade and or Revenge was an attempt at classic Kiss and was either Hot in the Shade and or Revenge successful in bringing back that classic sound? Claudia. I, I think uh, the short answer is yes. Uh, to me, for the most part, I think that what helped Hot in the Shade was the tour, okay? The tour was fantastic, so they brought back many, you know, uh, classics. Yeah. Uh, they got rid of all the color stuff, you know, in the costumes, and yeah. they went a, a bit, you know, back to the, to the black. Uh, Paul was on fire. Uh, we start to see a return from from Gene, okay? And uh, I, I'm not sure if we could say that um, uh, it was like a reconnection with the Kiss sound, but definitely it was an attempt to go back to the genre, okay? Uh, to something that was more Kiss-alike. Um, and just to, to, to wrap it up, to me, Revenge uh, was the ultimate comeback. For Kiss, yeah. uh, still one of my favorite albums to this day, and uh, and here we can say that Gene was back. Oh yeah, yeah, big time. Patrick, I think Hot in the Shade was them realizing that we need to get back to our roots, and I think they tried. They get a, you know, really the I salute the effort that they made. They kind of missed the mark, but I knew that. Oh, okay, they are trying to sound vintage, not. Yeah. Compared to the previous record, they're trying to get back to something they once had. So it had a very rock and roll overish kind of feeling mm -hmm. to it. And they completed the process with Revenge. Now, Revenge was totally focused and you can, you know, it was kiss meat and potatoes. And I liked the heavy direction they were taking. So to me, that's when Kiss really came back with Revenge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Greg? Okay, here's my spin. Um, I think it started with the with the um, Hot in the Shade album, with the video rise to it. Hey, the, good point. The makeup, the beginning of it saying, you take the makeup off? I don't know. Yes, no, maybe. You know, I think that was more subliminal <laughs> to fans. Oh, they're back. Oh, yeah, I remember the makeup. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Then the track I rise to it, a little more rocky, whatever. And then fully agree with you, Revenge. In your face, here you go. This is what you wanted, right? Everybody's back in a band, a tight knit fan, uh, band with with Paul. Uh, sorry, with uh, Bruce and uh, and Eric. M one of my favorite albums as the, as the comeback. But I think it started with that video. Let's test it. Let's put those makeup things in there and and relive the nostalgia and see what it, what it flies. Hmm. Once again, Craig on fire. That's a very good point. 
Very good point. Mm -hmm. Never thought of it that way. Overnight works for me. <laughs> <laughs> I found Hot in the Shade, like Patrick was saying, an attempt to bring back vintage Kiss, which I felt led to basically um, lazy writing, right? It was basically a whole bunch of demos. They didn't do much, much to mm -hmm. it and release it on the album, which looking back, it's actually a, not a bad idea to make it sound raw. You know, like 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 the first album. I I didn't think I don't think that succeeded very well, and I don't think most fans think think that succeeded. But but uh, Claudio, I agree with you. What brought back the classic Kiss was definitely that tour, and to this day, it's still one of my favorite one of my favorite shows. Was the Hot in the Shade? Man, you go to that show and you felt like you were back at a vintage Kiss concert. No, the yeah. makeup and costumes weren't there, but the energy, the show, the spectacle, the music, it was all there. When I was at that concert, I felt like Kiss was back. Not Dynasty, but Hot in the Shade, Kiss yeah. was back. Now, <laughs> now, was Revenge a quintessential Kiss album? You know, I hate when they say, the next album is going to be like like Destroyer. No, it, it, that's not possible. No album is going to be like Destroyer. It was written in a different time, a different era, different point in the band's career. But in terms of the evolution of typical Kiss, I think Revenge fits right in with the eighth album in their catalog, right after Love Gun, right after Creatures of the Night. Yep. Then you have Revenge. It all fits. Great it point. all fits. So if yeah. you look at it in terms of those eight albums... I guess that is typical Kiss and Revenge. I think, in that sense, did its job beautifully. And and Claudio, like you said, man, Gene was back and back with a vengeance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, just let, let me just add a couple of cents here. Uh, mm -hmm. This is to me. Um, I don't know if you guys are going to agree with me, but to me, what, what made the 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 Hot in the Shade tour so special is that finally they kind of go back to the original tempo of the songs because in most of the 80s they were playing so fast True. that you know you them. couldn't recognize yeah. the songs right so True. uh so they they kind of uh slow down a bit and uh just to just to wrap it up let me say that uh once again uh when we when we're talking about revenge we have to give a lot of credit to Mr. Bob Etherin because we, when we want to shake the tree, it definitely we, we need a a super producer. Yeah, puts him back on track and his you know his regiment of uh, that's right of, uh, of recording and getting focused and everything. Definitely, I remember going to that show, Hot in the Shade, like like perhaps the same one of my favorite shows. Some of the longest concerts that yeah, we've yeah. ever seen, 20, 25, 30 songs, whatever. Yeah. It just didn't stop. Yeah, yeah it was crazy. Ah, oh, it was fantastic. Yeah. You know, I, I stole your love. This and 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 cool. your point, your point, Claudio, about the tempo of the songs. Yeah, back to the kiss classic stuff. I don't want to hear that. You know, <laughs> what is that song? That was that was the yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I yeah. don't know. You know, it's um, you know, the 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 timing is perfect because we we didn't have the chance to discuss uh, off the soundboard, uh, Ukipsi in in detail. But don't you find that those songs, man, they they're, they don't sound like uh, Kiss songs. You know, no. it's so fast, man. Come on, well, you know, Eric. I don't know how he did for playing those songs at that at that Too time. Fast. Too fast. Man. So uh, once again, uh, moving a bit, um, uh, you know, uh, forward in time. Kiss again diverted from their sound with Carnival of Souls. Um, so for many fans, this is their worst album. And is it yours, guys? So if not, what is your least favorite album? Pask, I'm going to start with you. Okay, this one is is, is a mystery to me because they did so well with Revenge, and like I said earlier. The, the kiss was back with a vengeance. The kiss sound was back with a vengeance. It fit with the my original seven albums concept, you know. What on earth made them make this album? And I know it was Gene's idea. He wants something more grunge, and you know, mm -hmm. but they could have continued with the revenge type style, and it, I think it, it it would have been fantastic. And I know they did this because their their tour didn't go very well. 
Um, I, I guess they felt like the band wasn't going anywhere. And yep. once again, they thought, okay, we're not going anywhere. Once again, let's make it harder this time. Let's yeah. see if fans, if fans respond to that. And, 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 you, and you get this album. And then you, you have the reunion tour that came out. This album was completely ignored. And we, we ended up finding it on as a bootleg. Missing, by the way. I remember when I got the bootleg, it was missing the last three songs. And then when the album finally came out, no one, no one cared, yeah. and 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 it was so so far from anything seventies Kiss, even eighties mm -hmm. Kiss, yeah. that I I think myself included fans didn't know what to make of this album, yeah. and it was a colossal, I, I'm gonna say it, it was a colossal failure because there was no backing, no promotion, no no love for this album from the band. It was just put out there. You know, we made this album at, at the wrong time. We have the yeah. reunion tour. We're focusing on that. Here you go. Let's put it out there. Yeah. Make a yeah. couple of pennies on it. And um, and that's yeah. it. Now, I hate to question, you know, is this the least favorite album? <laughs> I, I, I actually, I actually like, I actually like this album, just like I like The Elder. But I've got to say that Carnival Souls and The Elder are two of my least favorite albums, okay. which I still really happened to like and I, mm -hmm. to this day I still listen to them several times you know so mm -hmm. it, it happens to be last because something has to be last but it exactly. doesn't mean I hate the album of course not yeah you don't you don't like it as much That's right, right. That's mm -hmm. right. Greg I, I think this album should have been called instead of Carnival of Souls a question mark um I think it was WTF uh okay. during that time um but it's it's a grunge album definitely uh it seems to me it's like one of those uh contractual fillers um let's put an album out because we need to put out so many albums let's try this and and we're I, like past was saying concentrating on something else but you know what we we tried this let's, let's just put it out and see how it goes it was leaked and it was it was not the, the same promotional a new kiss album this that the other thing um I, I just don't think that it, it got the love that it deserved because for me, I you have to listen to this album many, many times yeah. to appreciate it. Mm. There's some really killer tracks on there that that come to mind for me would be Childhood's End, um, Jungle. You know, Jungle, stuff like that, right? And uh, Rain. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pad's, uh, Brad's favorite song. <laughs> and... and um, that's my take on that. But the, you need to listen to it many times. Now, for an album that is worst, I don't really have a worst album because I love Kiss and I love all their different genres and diversities. But for me, disappointment, and I don't put it on the turntable very often, is Monster. Hmm. Okay. To me, okay. it's it's too glitzy. It's too... I, I don't know how to explain that, but there is some good songs in there. But it, to me, it's not one of my go-tos. Okay. But um, to me, Carnival Souls, well, they they were trying to do Revenge Part Two, but with a ground approach. Um, it's hit and miss. There's some good stuff on that, and I prefer that approach to, let's say, Crazy Nights, which is my least favorite Kiss album. Okay. Um, but that it's all about taste. But I think, uh, yeah, Carnival of Souls. Uh, it's kind of a weird time in Kiss history because I I don't think they were a hundred person focused on it they were recording it while they were working out uh, the reunion plans so yep. no real focus you know so maybe if it if they had really intended it to make it a real album it would have been a little bit different mm. but i think they were contra contractually obligated to make an album yeah. so that's my opinion yeah. well to me it's definitely not not the worst but uh, it's an album that I don't listen very often. And uh, once again, I think that there was a lot of confusion in the KISS camp uh, during those times. Yeah. They were trying to blend into the into the, into the the grunge scene while they were cooking the reunion with Ace and Peter. <laughs> so uh, it, it, was, it was interesting. To me, and this is, uh, I don't know if I said it before, so uh, get ready with the tomatoes, uh, Craig. But to me, if if no reunion, to me this would probably be in the last album of Kiss, oh, I, I, that, yeah. and and that could have been maybe the, the end the end of the band. Okay? Absolutely. So um, 
And just to go back to the question, my, my least uh, favorite, it's um, asylum. So mm. asylum, oh. I, you know, uh, there's tears are falling. Yeah, uh, who wants to be lonely? But the sound, uh, the sound of the guitar, I, I think um, it's, uh, I, I basically don't listen to the album at all. Yeah. Good point. All right, guys, we're on our final three. Psycho Circus, Sonic Boom, and Monster. Do you believe that any of these albums even come close to the classic Kiss sound? Patrick? No, they don't. I think with uh, Psycho Circus, they unsuccessfully tried to once again redo Destroyer, which they, for some re for lots of reasons, they weren't able to do. I think they did the best in the circumstances. Now, for Sonic Boom, I think they... For the first time since maybe Revenge, they tried to write as a band and to do something as a band. To me, it's kind of weak. It does have its good moments. And uh, unlike uh, Craig, I think Monster is a really great album because I think for once they didn't use any sort of like, they didn't say, oh, it's going to be the next Destroyer or it's going to be Destroyer, Mesa, Animalize, or let's just write songs and see what comes out. And I think it shows, and that's why I enjoyed it. And I had zero expectations from that album. So when I put it on, I was like pleasantly surprised. Mm -hmm. So, but the thing is the classic Kiss song, no, not at all. Okay. Craig? Yeah, I agree. Not even close to the, the classic Kiss sound. Like for me, the closest would be um, um, what he just said, the sonic boom. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, besides that, I don't think any of them are are in that that vein of uh, of classic Kiss stuff. I mean, um, it just goes to show a lot of those songs don't get played on the set list, right? Except for Say Yeah, which uh, I don't understand why it's there so much. But um, yeah, that's uh, none of them are 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 up in that uh, era. That's for sure. All right, Claudio. Um, it, it's a it's a tough comparison because we're talking, you know, thirty five years difference, right? So. Uh, compared to the to the kiss sound to me the, it's a, it's a great attempt to go back to the roots a great attempt to go back to the roots uh but of course it's not going to sound like like classic kiss because tommy is not ace and uh, eric is not peter right mm -hmm. different techniques different sound uh different equipment okay uh but to me uh those those three albums are um, again as i said before a good uh, kind of uh, trying to go back to to meat and potatoes. Um, they didn't achieve hundred percent of the goal, but uh, to me it was uh, it was uh, it was worth it. It was worth the attempt. You Pask? Okay, you want to see tomatoes? I'll show you tomatoes. There you go. How many fans have said, "Kiss is not Kiss with Tommy and Eric. Kiss is Kiss with Peter and Ace." Hey, we got Peter and Ace on Psycho Circus. We have a typical Kiss sound, not even close, not even close. So Kiss is not about the four members that, that, that makes a typical Kiss. It's the music that you're able to create that to me defines the classic Kiss sound. You had Tommy, you have, sorry, Ace and Peter, you still couldn't create that. So Psycho Circus, forget about it. Mind you, I like the album. I could even say I love the album especially when it came out. Psycho Circus, one of my favorite songs. Love that album, but not even close to um, a typical Kiss sound. Mm -hmm. um, Sonic Boom, though, I think was a typical, or at least it sounded like something that came from the 70s, I think. Yep. I don't think it's something that came from Kiss in the 70s. You know, if you look again to my, 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 my eight albums that I outlined before, where would you put Sonic Boom within those eight to make it sound like this has evolved or a part of the Kiss sound. I, I don't think you could put it anywhere, you know? So no, I don't think that album is typical, but I think it sounds like like a, a, 70s, a 70s album. And I remember, you know, I had a friend of mine, I mentioned this in a previous episode, she was in the car with me and we we're playing Sonic Boom. She's not a big Kiss fan, but she's heard of the band and she thought, wow, that sounds like classic Kiss, mm -hmm. you know? And I think she, she doesn't know what classic Kiss is, but I think what she meant to say is this is typical 70s music and it sounds yeah. and it sounds good. Now, why couldn't Kiss continue with that? Yeah. And then the big monster. You know, it's it's like we have revenge, we got carnival. We got Sonic Boom, we've got Monster. 
you know, again, I like Monster, but why take another big dive, you know, big turn on the big fork in the road there? Why not keep going on the same path? They're always taking a different trail. Enough, mm. you know? Um, and if you were to ask me, I like Sonic Boom way more than I like Monster. Okay. Good stuff. And uh, just to wrap it up, let me say something. I think that if Monster could have been produced by Bob Etherin, it could be a revenge number two. I agree. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. All right. So, uh, Keith's Army, we're one question away from the twist. Yes. So, we were given some homework by Mr. Pasquale, teacher Barry, to complete before the episode. So, we were asked to create two greatest Kiss albums. The first album uh, using only classic Kiss, and the second using only atypical Kiss songs. So what would your uh, greatest Kiss compilation albums look like? Mr. Craig, mm -hmm. I know that we, we love, uh, you, you love doing your homework. So uh, let's yeah. start with you. I yeah. always say that this is the only homework I ever got an A on. There you go. <laughs> So classic Kiss for me, it's um, Deuce, Detroit Rock City, Firehouse, Love Gun, Lick It Up, Crazy Nights, I Love It Loud, Calling Dr. Love, Shout It Out Loud, I Was Made for Loving You, Rock and Roll Night, Black Diamond, uh, War Machine, Shock Me, Christine 16, Strutter, and Nothing to Lose. Uh, atypical songs. So for me, it's uh, Rock Bottom, Charisma. Uh, I've had enough. I'm an animal eyes. King of the Mountain is what, the only song in that album really that has anything to say. I want you, Psycho Circus, Creatures, Hotter Than Hell, I, The Oath, Save Your Love, mm. of Dynasty, Cold Gin, Exciter, uh, I Stole Your Love, Parasite, and Not for the Innocent. Oh, nice. The the remix one, like the, the original with Paul and Gene on it. Right. Okay. Uh, Pat, let's start with Classic Kiss. Okay. Classic Kiss, Detroit Rock City, Love Gun, Deuce, Shout It Out Loud, Black Diamond, God of Thunder, Pristine 16, Shock Me, Beth, I Love It Loud, Strutter, 100,000 Years, Calling Dr. Love, uh, Firehouse, Cold Gin, Let Me Go Rock and Roll, Rock and roll night, watching you, she and nothing to lose. Okay. Uh, you need the atypical now? Okay, all the way. Anything for my baby, dirty living, lover all I can, rocket ride, thou shalt not. Hmm. And on the eighth day, deep wow. oath, larger than life, baby driver, within, into the void, larger than life. Naked City, all else breaking loose, take it off, a million to one, we are one, take me, and master and slave. Wow. Oh, wow. My goodness. I love it. I like it. I'm going That's, to your concert. Yeah, that's pretty <laughs> good, man. That's, how, many, how many songs you have on the, on the, on the, 20 each. 20, 20 each. Okay. okay. Maybe I cheated. Okay. No, 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 it's fine. It's fine. Okay. Yeah. Plus, all right. my friend. I, I, ha I have 10. All right, so typical Kiss songs. Number one, Detroit Rock City. Number two, I Stole Your Love. Number three, Strutter. Number four, Deuce. Number five, Parasite. Number six, Rock and Roll All Night. Number seven, Love Gun. Number eight, Beth. Number nine, I Was Made for Loving You. Number 10, Black Diamond. Typical Kiss. Nice, nice. Uh, atypical Kiss. Um, number one, Thrills in the Night. Two, wow. love her all I can. Three, I'll fight hell to hold you. Yes. Four, under the rose. Five, charisma. Six, all for the glory. Seven, mm. all for the love of rock and roll. Eight, who wants to be lonely? Nine, a million to one. And 10, childhood's end. Wow. Nice. Yes. Nice. Wow. So let, let me let me ask you guys one question, okay? So someone comes to you and says, I don't know anything about KISS. Give me a compilation. So would you give the uh, typical 
classic Kiss songs or the atypical? I would go with the atypical. Atypical? Yeah, sure. Why not? It's the why? best stuff and because it's the best stuff, according to me. Maybe because I'm tired of the other ones. Ah, okay. <laughs> that's why I asked the question. Okay. 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 Yeah. No, I, I would I would give the the typical Kiss the songs, typical yeah. uh, because that's an introduction to what yeah. Kiss yeah. is. Yeah. Um, I would give the casual fan, like maybe the fan that goes to the, to a Kiss concert, has come back from the show. That was amazing. I love the music. You like that? Now, Check this. this out. Yeah. Now I would give them my atypical. There you go. Points are valid. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. Love it. And what okay. about you, Claudio? I'm gonna go with my classic Kiss. Uh, Deuce, Black Diamond, Let Me Go Rock and Roll, Rock and Roll All Night, Detroit Rock City, Shout It Out Loud, I Want You, Love Gun, I Was Made for Loving You, Sure Know Something, uh, Creatures of the Night, Lick It Up, Heaven's on Fire, Crazy Crazy Nights, and Forever. Atypical, Let Me Know, Going Blind, Get Away, Come On and Love Me, Flaming Youth, Love Him and Leave Him, Take Me, God Love for Sale, I Stole Your Love, Magic Touch, Naked City, Only You, Keep Me Coming, A Million to One, King of Hearts, Heart of Chrome, yeah. Journey of a Thousand Years, and Shout Mercy. Ah, nice. Cool. Interesting, though. I, I, I find the atypical songs a lot more fun. Than, yeah, than the yeah, typical one, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> How many times I've changed songs on here, you know? <laughs> right. But that but that's it, right? Because we've heard the typical song so many times that we want to hear something a little different. Yeah. And Kiss gives us an opportunity to hear all these different songs out there. And, and this is what we come up with. I think it's yeah. I think it's fantastic. Fantastic. All right, boys and Kiss Army, it's time for the twist. So Basically, I asked you guys to come up with your desired set list of 20 songs, right? That's all I asked. I didn't tell you why I, I'm asking you guys for 20 songs for a set list. Now, this might sound like a strange request because if you think about it, this question has nothing to do with our topic tonight. Mm -hmm. I'm going to argue that it does. Because I want our listeners to know that the idea for this topic came from Patrick. And we all thought this is a great idea. Mm -hmm. So I started to think of questions in the direction that we can go with this particular episode. And as I, as I was thinking about him going, you know what? The idea of the many faces of KISS, the diversity of the KISS sound is not what this episode is about. It's about something else something really interesting that's been a debate among KISS fans for years. So before I tell you what that is, let's hear your 20 songs because there's a particular point I want to make. I need to hear your songs first. So let's start with Claudio. What are your okay. 20 songs for your set list? My, my 20 songs, and uh, I didn't have time to put them in order, okay? Because yeah. it's set list, it's but whatever. So it's a Deuce, Detroit Rock City, Shout It Out Loud, Rock and Roll All Night, Black Diamond, uh, Love Gun, God of Thunder, I Was Made for Loving You, I Stole Your Love, Creatures of the Night, 100,000 Years, Let Me Go Rock and Roll, The Oath, Tears Are Falling, Making Love, Come On and Love Me, Strutter, Firehouse, Parasite, and Forever. Okay, good. All right. Craig, what's yours? Mine's going to be a lot different than that, guys, because you know my. Uh, I put Detroit Rock City, King of the Nighttime World, Creatures of the Night, Deuce, Flaming Youth, uh, Danger, Exciter, Psycho Circus, I Stole Your Love, Fits Like a Glove, huh? Modern Day Delilah, uh, The Oath, Stan, Charisma. Here's a here's a one out there. Long Way Down. Oh, nice. Save Your Love, Unholy, Strutter, I and God Gave Rock and Roll to You. Okay. All right. Patrick. Okay. Detroit Rock City, Deuce, Shout It Out Loud, uh, I Love It Loud, Strutter, 100,000 Years, Calling Dr. Love, uh, Let Me Go Rock and Roll, 
uh, Naked City, uh, also uh, Watching You, uh, oh, I believe I put it twice, Strutter, sorry about that, uh, Firehouse, War Machine, uh, God Gave Rock and Roll to You, uh, Domino, uh, and uh, Rock and Roll Night, of course. Okay. All right. All right. So I was struggling with the, with, with the set list, right? What can we put on the set list? This is what I came up with. So I Stole Your Love. And there's no, again, no particular order in terms of how yep. they're going to do the show, where they're going to yep. split the blood, but balls on the fly. No, none of that. Okay. So I Stole Your Love, Deuce, Strutter, Watching You, Let Me Go Rock and Roll, Love Gun, Detroit Rock City, King of the Nighttime World, Unholy, Every Time I Look at You, Hide Your Heart, Psycho Circus, Creatures of the Night, I Was Made for Loving You, Shout It Out Loud, Come On and Love Me, Parasite, Black Diamond, God Gave Rock and Roll to You, and Rock and Roll All Night. Okay, now, I want your thoughts on the following. Fans have always complained about the set list. Why don't they put this? Why don't they put that? Right? And the argument is as well that because of the backing tracks and because of the nature of the show, they, only, they always play the same song because it's programmed. Uh, all the songs are programmed. The track list is programmed. So this is what they have to play and they can divert from that. Right? I don't necessarily buy that particular argument, right? Because in a sense, what this episode did was put us in their shoes. This entire discussion about the diversity of their music, about the the, the vastness of their their sound, their music catalog, is huge. What can they possibly choose as a set list that will make every fan happy? They can't. So. In a sense, this homework forced us to do exactly what KISS does before every single tour. Try to come up with a set list. Now, besides Craig, who's nuts, um, <laughs> you know, the three of us, what did we do? What did we, we did exactly what KISS does. Yeah. We, we mostly chose yeah. typical KISS songs, right? And if you, and if you look at your 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 typical um uh compilation, compilation album most yeah. of those songs are on your set list yep a lot of your atypical songs are not yeah. right so and, and and this is what and this is what i'm saying uh, it's not just about what the fans the the, the casual fans want to hear i'm arguing here this is what we want to hear yeah. because i think the four of us are you know the average typical kiss fan and look at what we came up with again. Yeah. Craig, Craig's nuts. No, no, but you know what? I think that I think that Craig's set list could be perfect for a cruise. Yeah. Yes. But when I, I chose. Sorry, guys. When I chose these songs, okay, except for a, a chosen few, they have played them in the past. Exciter, they've played in the past. Flaming Youth, they yeah. played in the past. You know, except for danger and and charisma. I mean, charisma. Gene did it recently at that thing in Vegas, so it's doable. Some of them, yeah, I get it. It's my wish list, whatever the case may be. Um, but like Pat says, a lot of these songs are staples that we 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 love hearing time yeah. in, time out. It's just those couple of songs that they need to throw in to to appease the diehards. That's that's my point on that. <laughs> Claudia. Yeah, what I wanted to say is that, you know, basically the same approach that I took to to select the songs for the compilation, Typical Kiss, this is what I did for the show. I, I, I put myself in the shoes of saying, inviting someone who doesn't know Kiss to come to a show. And which songs, I think, would have more impact on that person for someone who doesn't, who, who never saw his life, mm -hmm. and to me, that that's a, that's the rationale that I used to come up with the set list. That's... Okay, Patrick, what was your rationale? You you know, if you go to a Kiss show and if they start playing stuff that people don't know, the show is going to go down. So as much as we hate it, sometimes they have to keep the standards. That's it. 
It's mm -hmm. you know if they they can play maybe one or two odd songs yeah. just to please us, but they can't do a whole show of it. It's unrealistic to expect that. I I think there's a difference between what we want to hear on an album and what we want to hear live. Um, I loved Within from Psycho Circus. We all remember how that went live. Yeah. yeah. Not not so great. And you know, I I, yeah. I love personally, I liked my atypical kiss songs. Yeah. But most of those songs, I don't think they would work live. They they they, right. they just wouldn't again, Claudio, they would it would be cool maybe on a cruise. Yeah. They're messing around on stage. Oh my god, we heard this live. Or the Bruce Kulick band doing this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that would be cool. Yeah. At a kiss concert, it 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 just wouldn't work. Now, if if I think this as a typical kiss. Fan, don't you think the band thinks the exact same thing? Of that, course. You know, they know what I'm saying? So why that's okay? So that is exact that's exactly the point. That's exactly the point. So my final question to you guys is, you know, what do we want to say to the average KISS fan out there when it comes to the set list? Because I think we made the point that it is it is next to impossible to make everybody happy. And what we're going to get are typical classic Kiss songs, variations of those songs, and every once in a while, a, an atypical song thrown in here and there. That's been the pattern their entire career, and I don't see that. I don't see that ever changing. And if we're looking at the final show, like the final show in New York, I'm hoping they do a little something different for those final two shows. The only thing different they're going to do is maybe throw in a couple of new songs. That's it. But it's going to be the standard set list. Yeah, they can't do otherwise. They can't. They can't do otherwise. Listen, they have enough trouble coming up with a set list for a regular tour. Imagine the final. What? How difficult it would be for them. Yeah. Look how difficult it was for us. And and we came up with the exact same thing they would yeah. have. Yeah. That is exactly. the twist here. That is the point. And I think that is what really this episode was about. Yeah. I, I thought I thought that you were going to do kind of a cross check versus the the current set list, yeah. and I think uh, 70, 80 percent of the songs that we picked are on the set list today. Yeah. Yes, and Claudio, most of you, most of your list was was typical except for the oath. Uh, Patrick's it was mostly typical except for Naked City, and Craig. Well, Craig had Craig was you know wow. Yeah. Craig, Craig I was, was in dreamer. Kiss Cruise uh, format. <laughs> format, you know. But again, but again, you know, Craig represents uh, that that fan that yeah. that wants something different, yeah. um, and and that fan will go to a to a Kiss Cruise to get that experience. Yeah. But I don't think we're going to get that experience at a typical Kiss concert. Never no. going to happen. Never did happen. Never will happen. It's no. a wish list. Yeah. So your final thoughts. We'll start with uh, Claudio. Um, how do you feel about this this twist? Do you agree with what I'm saying? The direction I went with this, my interpretation of the topic of this episode. We, without without knowing, uh, because it was a surprise to all of us. Yeah. I I when when I saw you know the two compilations and then the set list, I kind of had an idea of what you wanted to go for, and uh, I loved it. I love the twist and I I I love the you know the point that you're trying to make here that you made actually. Uh that it's not so easy, man. It's not so easy for the band to to kind of uh uh make everybody happy. And at the end of the day, uh now with the band, you know, uh retiring from, from live shows, uh in my case, and speaking of, uh, for myself, th this is what I want to see. I want to see typical kiss. The, to me, it's a celebration of of what the band did over the years, and uh, oh, we I think we missed the opportunity to maybe see uh, obscure and and, uh, and rare songs in some of the other shows. They could have done it, but now as it stands now at let's say six months from re retirement from live shows, this is what I want to see, and I'm happy that you that you came up with this uh, with this idea, Pass, because I think it's a uh, it's a wake-up call that uh, we need to celebrate and not complain anymore. Mm -hmm. Patrick, your thoughts? Yeah, no, it's I'm pretty much with Claudia on that one. I mean, you know, they they can't, like I said previously, they can't make a, a set list of on no obscure songs. So they have to keep the show, you know, basically that people are going to be happy with. So, and unfortunately, it's not the twenty thousand fans are all hat are all hardcores like us. 
So in a sense, yeah, what you were saying is basically probably the underground stuff. We have the records to listen to if we want to hear that, you know. So or maybe the odd shows that we can see everywhere that uh, they tried their hands at one obscure song. Mm -hmm. But th the point is, when they play live, they have to make it work for the general fan base. Okay. Craig, what are your thoughts? Look, guys, I, I think Kiss is... is uh is a show band and doing the same thing day in day out it gets perfectionized right so like you were saying with uh with the different theatri theatrics and and lights and special effects and everything it's it's day in day out it's routine it's like going to see the phantom of the opera on broadway where it's the same show for the last 15 20 years it's perfection that's what you want you don't want a band going up there playing a song and, and butchering it um but i do feel that songs that they have done before i mean i was overzealous with with putting some of those you know obscure tracks in there but i could see them doing the fits let's go love or or etc because yeah. they've done it that's the only thing i wanted to put a few things off off the take take them out dust them off balls off and and, and try it right um i i agree that those maybe should have been on kiss cruise whatever but i, yeah. I think there, there's still a a valid reason for one or two songs in there but you know what it is a it, and they said it many times right they they get mad when the show doesn't go off uh, to perfection. If uh, you know jeans uh, get stuck halfway up 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 the uh, up the stage and then puts it back down, it, it's it ruins the effect for the, for yeah. the people who are buying the tickets. Yeah. But um, yeah, and all in all, we all have different opinions, and, and it's respectful atmosphere and great. I mean, it's what it is what it is. I, I think it took us over an hour and a half to to basically make a very simple point that it is difficult to come up with a set list. Sure. Yeah, Claudio, sure. I agree with you 100%. Let's enjoy the band for what it is. Let's enjoy the music. Sure. There are other ways to listen to the music, like Patrick was saying, listen to the albums. Uh, like like uh, Craig is saying, go on a Kiss Cruise, go to an expo, go listen to the Bruce Kulick band. You're yeah. you're going to you're going to have the experience of these songs one way or another. It doesn't have to be one way the Kiss concert. There are so many different ways to experience the band. So if we take away anything from this, heading towards the end of the road, and for those of us who are going to be at the final show in New York, man, th that may be the last time we're going to see these guys live in this yeah. capacity. Yeah. Forget who's going to be there, who's not going to be there, what songs they're going to play. Enjoy Kiss, mm -hmm. because it's never going to happen again. Yeah. That's right. it. That's my point. Awesome. Great. Beautiful. Okay, well, guys, I think this this has been awesome, man. So it's uh, I think this is the longest discussion panel we've yeah. ever had, but it was so much fun. We could keep going forever if it's not sure. because of Cray has to go to work. So because <laughs> <of> this, <laughs> but uh, no, look, I this is something that we wanted to discuss for the for the longest time. Uh, yeah. You know, different you know music styles, diversity, and uh, when we think that everything has said has been said this is the proof that it's not we could be talking about yeah, this forever forever so uh you know i just wanted to thank you guys again uh, pat and craig it's always a, a true pleasure to have you in a uh, lot of respect and uh you know different opinions all the time you know with uh, it's it's beautiful man this is family thank you so much thanks awesome. thanks you know and kiss army uh, we're talking to you now we we want to hear from you in the comment section um, let us know what you think about this particular twist. What What are your thoughts about that? Here, as a Kiss fan, from Kiss fan to Kiss fan, we'd like to know what your thoughts are. It'd be uh, It'd be interesting. So once again, guys, thank you so much for being on the show. It's thank been you. a blast. Yeah. And to the rest of the Kiss Army, if you have any questions, comments, or ideas, please send them to talk to me at kissarmynationpodcast.com. Until the next time, remember, never stop rocking. Take care, everyone. If you enjoyed this episode, like and subscribe on YouTube or follow us on Spotify, Automatic, iHeartRadio, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Don't forget to make yourself heard. Leave us a comment on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. See you all soon, Kiss Army.